so that we may more correctly understand the symbols that we're going to be addressing in this portion of scripture. Shall we pray? Gracious Father in heaven, we have great need of you as we are examining these examples and these symbols. We need your wisdom and we need your guidance so that we may more properly apply these symbols to that which we are seeing occur today. We ask, Father, for the guidance of your Holy Spirit. May your Spirit be with each one of us. We ask for your blessing as we assemble together. That this may help us to grow in character like yours. That we may accept the admonitions that are being presented and may come into a clearer understanding of all that we are to understand at this point from this example that is given to us. We thank you that we can assemble together freely. We ask, Father, for your blessing and claim your promise that where two or more are gathered, there you will be also. Help us now to breathe the very atmosphere of heaven. Direct us and guide us so that that which we address and the manner in which we address it may be representative of your character. To this, we thank you. For this, we praise you now and always in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Where we left yesterday. Delilah has now fastened Samson's hair together with a pin. So she has fastened the seven locks or the seven braids and tested him again, saying, The Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And he awoke out of his sleep and went away with the pin of the beam and with the web. So his hair was woven together. Here again, Samson was going through another test. But he was not willing to walk away from Delilah. Even though he knew he was in danger, he had so much confidence in himself that he was not willing to give credit to the fact that his strength was of God and God alone. And she said unto him, How canst thou say, I love thee, when thine heart is not with me? Thou hast mocked me these three times, and hast not told me wherein thy great strength lieth. Okay, I just want to back up here. So, Go ahead. Um, now, it's kind of interesting, because um, you know, in the King James it says, fastened it with a pin. But... That's not really what's happening here. I mean, this has to do with it being woven into, into this fabric. But the word fastened um, means uh, to blow, clap, strike, sound, thrust, give a blow, blast. Um, and it can also refer to the blast of a horn. Um, so his... Uh, this hair being woven into this fabric. I mean, the idea is that with this this loom, uh, I mean, you're you're weaving weaving. You're making a fabric with his hair, so it becomes a part of this fabric. But we have this symbol of of a blow or a blast of a horn. 
So how would we attach that symbol to what we're, how we're understanding this? Is this not a warning? Mm -hmm. We have a blast of a horn. So is Samson not being warned of his great danger? Um, well, no, Samson's the one giving the warning. I mean, this, this is a warning. Um, I mean, this is about a message that's a warning. So let's put it. So down. is this Samson in, in weaving, having the hair woven into this fabric? If Samson is the one giving the warning, is this Samson accepting the character of Christ? Well, it's not yet the character of Christ. I mean, that's going to be this fourth one, but it is a message regarding that. So, I mean, it's the third angel's message that's okay. being talked about here. So apply that. I mean, you're, you're saying it would be the third angel's message, which we accept is a warning because it's a warning against accepting the mark of the beast. Right, about the Sunday law. Yeah, and so that's the message that's being given here. But the character of Christ is, is going to be tested after the close of probation. I mean, it, it has to be developed before, and they're going to pass this test. You know, the 144,000. Okay, agreed. But yeah. isn't, don't they have to have that character in order to give that message? Yeah, yeah, that's true. So they're giving this message. And, and this is the third angel's message that's being given in connection with the Sunday law. So, yeah, they do have the character of Christ. But the so eyes, yeah. So the, the point that I'm, I'm driving at is if this is the case, then having the locks or the braids woven into this fabric would be a representative of the garment of the righteousness of Christ. Yeah. And it's, it's having the, the experience. Things are woven together in this experience. Right. Right. But in, in our a line that we have, that we're personally in, our line is still typical of what is to come. And so in our line, this is typified by this complex intertwining of experience that we are going through at the present time as a movement and these prophetic lines. Okay. Why would it be important for scripture to reveal that he awakened out of his sleep? And there's no liars in wait mentioned in this one either. Just Correct. So he was so at ease with Delilah here that he fell asleep. Mm -hmm. not having wires in wait, not having someone else to, to call on. Delilah was there one-on-one -on -one with Samson. So he awakens out of his sleep and went away with the pin of the beam and with the web. He went away with his hair woven in the fabric. Yeah. So, and his hair represents the 2520. And yeah. the, the warp represents the parallel lines. And the complexity of this is uh, what we are presently understanding. But if you're, if you're going to apply the warp in that way, then why, where are you applying the wolf? Well, the woof is the hair. 
The hair is what's woven into the warp. Okay. Then what is the pin? Well, that's and that's that is part of the system for threading this um, hair. So the pin and the beam are representative are are part of the system for braiding braiding the hair. Yeah. So you have the shuttle, right? And the pin could be like a a, a, a paddle. Right or a stake or whatever. It's a nail. That's the other ways it's trad translated. So the idea is, you know, and, and it's hard to know exactly what this loom was like because we have other looms, you know, modern, more modern ones, and so they they might be different. But the idea is that they they thread this this hair. She would thread it through the warp, and and the shuttle also I understand comes down and presses the um material together like the thread together because it has to be tightened as you go through as you thread this but yeah there's different systems in which th this is done so these are just part of the loom uh the web of course being the the warp itself <coughs> so so it's hard to know what particular parts these are of the machine but but the pin, well, there's this, I don't know if the pin is methodology, um, but uh, this is all part of the system of understanding truth that we are using. So I would think this whole loom is to some degree Miller's rules. I mean, it's the whole system of chronology and putting everything together that's being represented in this third test. And, and as I said before, it goes from simpler to more complex in that you have, you know, just a single uh, bowstring that's, you know, it's not, it's not intertwined like a rope is. But now we have something much more than just intertwined or twisted around itself. We have something that has this complex uh, structure, like, like a fabric. So if you think of the, the different things you have, you know, a single string, you have a rope, and now you have a fabric. And so that's going from simple to more complex in its progression. Okay. Stepping back for a moment. Given that the first two tests both involve liars and weight, Would this be a, an example, again, of Millerite history, where the first two messages being given were being given to those that later wound up very critical of the methodology of the Bible interpretation? where this one with the third representing the third angel's message is for those that would be benefited by the first two angels message mm -hmm. and bringing that right back into the timing of the movement post 2001. Is that possible? Mm, well, it is. I mean, I still take it that the first two are representing, you know, the first one represents prior to 9-11, the second one after. All right. And the third represents the Sunday law. And um, it's interesting there, Iran noted uh, Luke 12, verse 7. Of course, that's a significant symbol in and of itself. Um, but the sum is even more. Yeah, so that's just the, the gematric sum of the verse itself. But even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. 
Fear not, therefore, ye are of more value than many sparrows. So that it adds up to 1,087, uh, the English gematria of that verse in the King James. Um, so it's an interesting number representing July 18th. But would this also not be a reference to the fact that here he has these seven locks of these seven braids? Yeah. Which are representative of the of the seven times. Right. Which it really has been the basis for all of this chronology in the first place and all of these symbolic numbers. In our understanding of them. Okay. I'm just looking at the at the interesting tie-in here with with what we're addressing out of Luke 1614, or excuse me, Judges 1614. Mm -hmm. But in each of these messages, Delilah comes to Samson and says, The Philistines be upon thee, Samson. In this one, he awakens out of his sleep. Does this give us another reference to the five wise and the five foolish virgins? Yeah, it would it would be a reference, which is what I was thinking. Okay. Because they, they wake awaken. And he goes away much like the wise when they are invited into the feast. Mm -hmm. Because <clears throat> the foolish go to search for oil. Yeah, well, and, and this word went away. I mean, there's different ways in which you, you're going to see um, these words occur in Hebrew, right? So went away isn't always the same uh, Hebrew words. But in this case, it properly means to pull up, especially the tent pins, that is start on a journey. So, um, so it's kind of interesting. Um, but does this also give us another reference to JL and Cicero? Um, I don't know if that's what I would put. I mean, maybe. Um, um, anyway, it's more than just, you know, he went away. I mean, this is... Uh, you know, because that could mean lots of things in English, but in Hebrew, it's it really means to start on a journey. I mean, I mean that's that's the idea of that word most commonly. To, you know, to pull up your ten pins, but why why that is being used here? I don't know. Is it being used to symbolize that a preparation is necessary for the message of the angel of Revelation 18? Now, it's kind of weird. Yeah, so we're going to have, I mean, so it doesn't talk about the liars and weights here in, in this third one, right? Correct. But, you know, she's still going to say the Philistines, Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And then it's, it, it says here in, uh, this is Young's literal translation, um, and he waketh out of his sleep and journeyeth with the pin of the weaving machine and with the web. That's how he translates it. Um, so he's, he's translating it literally, of course, because it's Young's literal translation. And 
So, so here in this sense, I mean, there's nothing about the liars in wait. So when she says that the Philistines are upon thee, Samson, um, why, why is that if there's no liars in wait? Or maybe there are, we just, they're not mentioned, but. Or is she just going to test him this time to see what he's going to do? Well, in this in this situation, I would think that the latter is more what's happening than the former. I don't think that there were liars in wait here because they're not mentioned. Yeah, and I think that she's she's distrustful that he's actually going to give her the real reason. Well, I, th I think that the Philistines have distrusted her in in her power of getting this from Samson. Yeah, that could be. I mean, why why should we hang around to take this man that is still so powerful? And I think that the the verses we're going to next be studying is going to bear some of that out. Yeah, because now they're going to believe her in the this next time. Or at least it seems that they 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 believe that she has found the secret. But anyway, well, let's go then. Go on then. With with the I mean, rest. If, if I was to use an old analogy, isn't this very much like the boy who cried wolf? The yeah. first couple of times they listened, and then after that they didn't listen to it. Yeah. Okay. And she said unto him, "How canst thou say I love thee?" when thine heart is not with me. Thou hast mocked me these three times and hast not told me wherein thy great strength lieth. The woman is trying to show her power over Samson. So if we turn this on its head, what is she doing? So if you're saying if we're looking at this ironically. Yes. Okay. So so this is a message because we, we've, at least I have taken the position that Delilah represents um, the chronology, the message of July 18, because her, the number, Hebrew number for her name plus uh, the gematria of her name multiplied, and, um, and also the gifts that being offered to her of 1,100 pieces of silver from each of the five uh, Philistine kings. So, so we have something here that symbolizes the five wise, the five foolish, um, something that symbolizes July 18th and the 26th day of the fourth month, and also the prophetic mirror. So we have all these symbols attached to Delilah. So she's testing God's people, right? Or she's testing a message that produces God's people. Okay. And um, and we still haven't decided how to put this on a line yet. So we haven't drawn out uh, a specific line, which we're going to do hopefully this week, but definitely by next week. Um. So this is um, this is um, and and the part that you asked specifically that Delilah is doing that we want to invert. Well, when we turn this on its head, yeah, she's challenging Samson in saying, "How can you say that you love me?" Right, which I mean, this is or this movement is a challenge about our love towards God. Okay, but she's also saying your heart is not with me, and I'm being I'm being mocked. So how do you turn that on its head? How do you find the irony in what's being said here? Well, they're going to actually be the opposite they're going to be representing 
God. They're not going to be mocking. They are actually the ones mocked. I mean, this message is what's mocked. Okay. So we're not mocking God in this movement, but God is testing us. We're the ones being mocked. Is God testing us to see if we will rely upon his strength? Yep. Now, so Samson relied on his strength, but we are not going to rely on our strength. I didn't say our strength. I said on God's strength. Yeah, so we're going to rely on God's strength, not ours like Samson did. So that would be the opposite. All right. <clears throat> And it came to pass when she pressed him daily with her words and urged him so that his soul was vexed or shortened unto death. Why is it important that we see that her questioning to Samson went on daily? Yeah, it, it actually doesn't say that. It says she pressed him the whole day. I'm not sure why they translated it as daily. Um, I mean, maybe you could say all the days. Maybe that's how they're kind of interpreting it. Um, yeah, I'm just going to look at this a bit more. It seems to me, though, that this is... Could be like, like more like all the day. Um, hmm. Now let's remember this example is occurring in the twentieth year of his judging Israel. Yeah. Well, this is, this is occurring at the end of his time as a judge. Yeah. Yeah, because it's, it's kol hayamimim. Uh, yomim. So it means uh, all the days, literally. Uh, so it could be that all the days, uh, but it's the whole of these days. So... So I guess daily is possible. Yeah, it's at the end of these 20 years. But as we're asking about this, I mean, we realize that the daily that is expressed elsewhere is paganism. Yeah, but that's not related here. That's unrelated in Hebrew. So is this she, tam, tamid or anything like that. This isn't continually. This is is uh, the whole day, the whole days, I guess, literally. But is this not also representing that she is continually pressing him? Yeah, but that's a different idea, the Talmud, even though we can translate it in English that way. That's not, that's not really um, the idea of Hatamid uh, compared to what's being presented here. Uh, I just wouldn't compare these two things. Even though they, they end up, you could translate them to similar words in English, English, they're not really related in Hebrew. The ideas aren't related. All right. Turning this upside down, she is pressing him. So is she continually giving a message? No, the idea here that I gather from this, this has to do with time, right? This has, when, when we deal with the whole days, if we're going to take prophetic periods, 
These are all of the prophetic periods that are being represented. So you're saying that we're talking about 360, 1260, 1335, 2520. We're talking about chronology. 1290, everything. Yeah. Everything comes together here. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Now there's see there's the problem that people have when when you look at something like a mirror. Remember things are the same but opposite, right? Okay. Right. So like in a mirror, you, you can't take everything and literally make it opposite. For instance, if you look at the prophetic mirror of the 20, 2520, at the beginning of the 2,604 years, you have a civil war, right? All right. Well, you don't take the word war and at the end of it, make it um, peace, right? It's still a civil war, but part of it is inverted. The north becomes south and the south becomes north. That is... In the one, the north is confederate. In the other, the south is confederate, right? All right, agreed. So, yeah, so, you know, so you have a mirror, things still look the same, right, in a mirror, but there are opposites that happen. So not everything's completely opposite, but there are certain aspects that are opposite. So here, obviously, there's still a message being given. This is Delilah's message, which is referring to the whole of the days. And if we're going to take that sort of in a more literal symbolic sense, that is, we take hold of the days and we apply it symbolically to what our message is, this would refer to all the dates, all of the lines, all of the the spans, all of the chronology, right from the beginning of this movement to the present time. That is what is pressing Sam Samson, right? Right. So now his soul is going to be vexed unto death, right? So you wouldn't say, you know, his soul is going to be the opposite of vexed, you know, unto life or something like that. But... But what we can see is that this movement is being pressured by something, and that something is the whole message that's been given it in relationship to chronology. So at that point, Samson, who represents the message of this movement, that is the everlasting gospel, the product of the everlasting gospel, which is both the people to give a message and the message itself, um, he's going then to say to Delilah what the power of his strength is, right? So this becomes a really key point to understand what this fourth test is about. Because he's revealing where his strength is coming from right and his strength does come from the vow from god right it comes isn't it that it comes because he adheres to the vow as a nazarite well that's where it should come from though he's broken these vows all through this whole story agreed but now the symbol the main symbol of these, which is going to be his hair, is going to be cut off. And we would try to have to understand what that means because we're going to have to take it ironically, right? We're not going to believe that the 2520 then is somehow removed from the message of the movement, right? We'd have to look at this, what this humbling of Samson that's going to occur. Um, you know, his eyes being put in all, all those things, uh, must represent something positive once we turn it on its head. Okay.
Then he told her all his heart and said unto her, There hath not come a razor upon mine head, for I have been a Nazarite unto God from my mother's womb. If I be shaven, then my strength will go from me, and I shall become weak and be like any other man, with other being a supplied word. Now, here, translators would have gone to Micah 7.5. Trust ye not in a friend, put ye not confidence in a guide. Keep the doors of thy mouth from her that lieth in thy bosom. We see that in Judges 14, his wife, the one that he selected of the Philistines, was very much like Delilah. Thou dost but hate me, but lovest me not. Thou hast put forth a riddle unto the children of my people, and hast not told it me. And he said unto her, Behold, I have not told it my father nor my mother, and shall I tell it thee? Samson, we're seeing here, made very, very poor choices of those with whom he was looking to enter into covenants, relationship with. So if we're looking at this ironically, then those with whom Samson, the representation of Samson as Christ looks to enter into are people that Christ has to trust implicitly and that are worthy of that trust, where these women that Samson is entering into covenant with were not worthy of his trust. Right? Yeah, well, these would be um, messages. Right. Right, because these are the three angels' messages that are, are being represented. Even though we usually have women representing a church, uh, they're really representing messages here in the story of Samson. Okay. Because we can see that with Delilah, it represents a message. Um, so, um, I mean, these are the messages that guide us. This is the everlasting gospel, which Christ embodies right i mean he comes he's the light that comes into the darkness he's the increase of light the everlasting gospel it's it's embodied in his his life his words his actions and in his death and resurrection so that that's that's the line you know that we have that illustrates the gospel so if we're going to take this story and we're going to try to, you know, put it on a line, I mean, we can put it on the line of Christ. We could take the story of Samson and line it up with Christ, and we could probably, um, I think, quite easily see how this parallels Christ in, in more ways than other people have, just because we understand the lines better. We could take the story of Samson and show that it is the story of Christ coming to this earth to redeem mankind. But in this case, Samson obviously shows this ironically, as we've, we've pointed out. Now here, we're going to have this, this fourth message. So we know it's the 3-1 combination. And, and we're going to have to try to place that in our history. So we can take these first three tests and we can say, well, these, these are the first three angels. These are the three angels' messages. But the fourth, we know, is also the second. Okay, so this being the second, where yeah. he is telling her with all his heart. If we were to go back to the second test, how would we show this? Well, so... Well, I don't know if it's so much that he told all of his, her heart. The thing is to understand what the second message is about. So the second message is a call out of Babylon, right? If we look at it in Millerite history, 
And it's going to be that message with the, um, because there was a, a moral fall that occurred in Millerite history when the first horn, Protestantism, fell. But that, that is going to progress. It's going to progress to um, a, a more complete fall in our day. And, and we see that with the Christian world. So the thing about the Christian world that, that sort of has caught Adventists off guard is that it's not, it's not even close to being Christian. At least one time it sort of appeared more Christian. But the Christian world now is so much like the world um, that it's it's basically Sodom and Gomorrah, right? Agreed. I mean, the Christian world hardly stands for anything anymore. Christians hardly know anything about the Bible or support anything moral. Christians commit adultery, they drink, they do drugs, um, they abort babies, they become transgender and homosexual, and it's all accepted. So there isn't any difference from Christianity in the world. Okay, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try something on you. Okay. Let's, let's consider, I mean, I'm, I'm, yes, I'm looking at this in a mix of figurative and literal. Mm -hmm. The first message, the first test given Samson was if they buy me with seven green worths that were never dried, mm -hmm. seven green new cords. Mm -hmm. We made the application here of this being symbolically the seven times of Leviticus 26. Right? Um, well, there definitely is a tie to that. But if this is the first angel's message and we parallel it with our movement, Jeff doesn't have an understanding of the seven times until after 9-11. So if this is representing the history before 9-11, uh, it wouldn't represent the seven times as such. Okay, but I'm... I'm it would represent the lines. Yeah. I'm taking this back a little further and I'm asking, does this represent... Millerite history from 1833 to, let's say, 1839. Um, I would say till 1844. No, I'm, I'm not going to go that far yet. There's a reason. Okay. Okay. Let's okay. say 39. So you're going to go to, uh, why 39? Just bear with me. Okay. Okay. Now. If this represents the initial messages being given by Father Miller, there's a lot that is being awakened. So in a similar manner, Elder Jeff was giving a, a message beginning in 1989 mm -hmm. that began to waken people up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, we come to this with the second message. And Delilah said unto Samson, Behold, thou hast mocked me and told me lies. Now tell me, I pray thee, wherewith thou mightest be bound. And he said unto her, If they bind me fast with new ropes that never were occupied, then shall I be weak. Wasn't the application of chronology very new as far as messages were concerned, say from 1839 to 1840? Mm -hmm. So if this is the second angel's message to give glory to God, would these new ropes be the introduction of chronology during yeah. the Millerite time and then looking at this with what Elder Jeff was presenting from, say, 2001 to 2005? Well, you know, yesterday we were talking about those 
those lines that are being bound up together, right? And, you know, are twisted and made into the the hauser or the rope, not necessarily the lines anymore. The lines are now ropes, right? So yeah, I could I could see that. Yeah, so I mean, there are different ways to look at this. So we can take this this whole story of Samson, we can put it in the time of Christ. And then we can also put it in the time of Millerites. And we can say that each of these represents the first, second, and third angel's message as given in Millerite history, the third angel arriving October 22nd, 1844. And that the fourth represents our history. Right. Right, so we can do that. And, and there's nothing wrong with that at all. Um, we can also take this and line it up with uh, this repeat of history itself, that is, the first and second angel's messages being repeated, um, the second angel joining with the third angel that has already occurred in Millerite history. So in a sense, ours is already a repeat. It's already the fourth. But we're going to take that and zoom in and see this exactly what we see in the Millerite line. We're going to zoom in to that fourth one and see a line itself. That line would be the whole history from 1989 up until the second coming of Christ. Okay. But, we're also, but we also can zoom in into the Sunday law symbol itself. And, and we can take um, this, um, th this present history, starting with, you know, 9-11 or... You know, we could have 9-11 or 11-9. We can have July 18th in there. We can have December 25th, 2021. And we could look at it as this history. So, so that becomes part of the problem when we start to zoom in. We can see the same lines repeating because we're zooming into a waymark. But we use the past to understand the present. Right. Okay. So, we, so we need to understand Millerite history and how it applies. We need to understand how it applies to the time of Christ. Um, but we're sort of looking at all of these levels at the same time. But where we started with Judges, well, Judges chapter 2, is we recognized that Judges was referring to our history from 9-11 up until 2023 because of what was being shown in each of the verses in Judges That's right. 2 as representing those years. And so, so that's where we have to, to, to get our, our focus. So, so we, we definitely don't neglect this parallel with Millerite history. But we, we, we want to bring the focus now to our time. Well, I mean, we need to examine these other things as well. Well, I mean, the, the reason I bring this and I'm, I'm addressing this the way that I am. Mm -hmm. If we have a clear understanding of Millerite time lines and Millerite time frame, it will add to a clear understanding of where we are currently. Right. So we do know that we can take these ropes and we can look at it in Millerite history as the, the development of the chronology that occurs right. after Miller first begins presenting. It starts to become much more entwined, right? Correct. Okay. So, the, so the, the message grows, it becomes more developed, and then you have Samuel Snow who's going to even provide more information where they're now going to um, have a prediction for the actual day of Christ's return in October 22nd, 1844, which is not something Miller was want to do. So, Miller, Miller was very reticent to, to make that prediction. Right. So now we have, um, but that develops out, apart from Miller. And that's one of the things we see in this movement as well. Uh, we can see the same thing with Jeff. You know, I mean, obviously he's reticent about any time setting. We end up with time setting. Now, of course, it's it's symbolic time setting, not well understood by the movement that it's symbolic, and 
and rejected because we we make a literal prediction of an event and it doesn't occur, which should have just told us that we're in a symbolic line, not that we were wrong um, and understood the, 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 the purpose of it. Right. So, so we're still not predicting any events, but we still have time. And we now know we can measure the time and that we can see after events have passed that it was the time. And this is an important part. So this is that new rope, uh, which is the second angel's message. It now um, matures in the fourth. Is that how we would... It's now how about, how about that it dries in the fourth? Well, I think the idea, you know, because when you look at this verse, um, you, I mean, my, my idea is that when you talk about a rope, now, um, I had a friend who worked at Wire Rope Industries in Edmonton, and um, they had to build all kinds of ropes for construction. I mean, these are steel ropes and so forth. And they have a testing bench. That is, you have to you have to build a rope, but you also have to test the rope. How much can it bear? And so you you pull this rope until it breaks. Some of these are huge cables that they're testing um, because you have to know what at what point they will break, and then they have to be rated. And, and that's how I look at this idea of these new ropes. They haven't been tested. It's not so much that work has never been done. They've never been occupied. Um, but it's that they've not been tested. Uh, does that make sense? Actually, yes. Okay. Can you explain how it makes sense? Well, to me, I understand it because there's an inspection process that goes along with all the material um, that I deal with. And um, it, it produces either the Rockwell hardness or the tensile strength. And uh, if you don't do the testing, uh, then how can you guarantee uh, how much it'll hold? Mm -hmm. Now, there's two, two Hebrew words that are going to be translated as occupied right so so they don't just have one hebrew word now uh the first word means to do or make um in the broadest sense and widest application to accomplish something uh to become bear bestow bring forth bruise be busy uh, so it has all of these different meanings to be industrious uh, to be occupied is one of the meanings of course to practice, prepare, procure, provide, uh, sacrifice, serve, set, so show, sin, spend. Um, so lots of different works, words that it can be translated as that one word. The second word um, properly means deputyship, that is ministry, generally employment or work. Um, so there's kind of two words that have somewhat a related meaning uh, but to make work, they were never made to work, right, or occupied, right? That's that's the idea. There's there is um, the, these have not been used, so they have not been tested, and those are the things that he has said that will make him weak, so that he shall be as all men, right? Now, also, this idea of new new ropes is just that they're they're fresh, right? Um, doesn't necessarily mean because these ropes, I don't think it's about being dried or being wet or anything like that. I think it's just that they're they're new, they're they're brand new brand new made. They haven't been tested or used, and those are the ropes that he's supposed to be bound with. And um. If we're taking it as something new in this movement, um, how would we then take this testing of these ropes, ropes that have not been used or tested or certified in some way, um, how would that relate then specifically to what has happened in this movement after 
July 18th. Yeah. Right. So here we have something where uh, we can't really, and, and this is part of the problem that I had. So when we introduced time setting in 2018, I mean, the one thing I had to see when I first heard that we were going to produce some date, I, I said, first, it has to be something that's seen by everyone. It can't be something that's sort of extremely subjective. Yeah. I mean, especially if, if you're going to convince me of it, um, it would have to be very objective. Now, when Tess presented her arguments for November 9th, uh, to me, I was not really convinced. I knew God was leading the movement, but I didn't think that what she had presented was sufficient to come up with a date. I mean, I thought she was there was something about it. But it wasn't until it was being presented by Daniel from Brazil, and he wasn't even really presenting her arguments. He was just talking about time setting in the movement. But I just decided at noon to do this calculation of how many days it was going to be to November 9th and found that from noon on October 13th, 2018 to November 9th, 2019, it was 391 and a half days is we're going to start at midnight on November 9th. That's normally how you do it in a calculator, uh, calendar converter calculator. And so that it was 391 and a half, I understood the significance of that right away because it's the number of the years of the kings of Judah. So, so here we had something rather objective. And then, of course, everything fell into place for July 18th. But in all of this, my question was, can we actually predict an event? And I wasn't really very convinced that we could predict an event. I knew we could predict a date. That is, I believed that the dates were correct. But what was going to happen on those dates? Um, for me, I wasn't certain. And I mean, I knew that if something was going to happen to Nashville on that date, it would be because we had predicted it. But as we got closer to that date and, and God showed me that we we're on a, a line of failed predictions, uh, I became less and less confident that the event would happen. But I knew that everything pointed it to it happening. Of that, I was 100% certain. I wasn't like, well, I don't think, you know, this. That we Jeff, Jeff had said that this is a, you know, this, there could be a disappointment with this. And, and he made that very, very clear. It's not like it, you know, he wasn't saying it. He didn't pick up on it. He was, he was very cognizant of that. Right. And he used two examples, the story of Jonah and the story of Abraham offering up Isaac. Right. right? And, and those became extremely powerful afterwards as we continued to under, understand the lines, as we went through the history, we now could see, how significant the story of Jonah was to our movement and, and how significant the story of Isaac being offered up was and how they, they show that what we were doing was being led of God, but we, because we were doing something that in, in the case of Jonah, he knew it wasn't going to happen or he thought that God might not have it happen. And so he's going to have this disappointment where he's going to be mocked and he feels he's losing his influence. But in the story of Isaac, we see that this is something where God's leading us to do something that goes against his law, in a sense, right? Time setting. So, so the whole idea, I guess, here, if we're going to bring it down to something, that um, God has to test us. And these new ropes that never were occupied or never tested, these are not just the chronology, but it's the people who are presenting this chronology. The message itself is being tested. Right. Right. That's, that's the way that I would understand it. And we mm -hmm. can see it in Millerite history, and we can see it in our history. Yeah, I, I, I think you're on track with that. So, so we know that that history is going to be repeated. 
So when we deal with the second and it being repeated, um, right now under this message, we have this complex weaving of character with these lines. But then we're going to come to this point where these locks are cut off. And we're going to have to understand what that means if it's the fourth, how it's related to the second. Right? So That's, I mean, it's a very roundabout way to, to get to what we're getting at. But. I got a sidebar. Um, those, two, those two witnesses that, that Jeff had put out there, you know, Abraham and um, the Nineveh story with Jonah. Yeah. If you really think about it, you know, we had those two individuals uh, in that whole, um, in the whole of the movement, because one of them were, you know, pissed uh, about that it didn't happen. And the other ones were like <laughs> happy that they were able to have a substitute. Yeah. So it represents the, the in a sense, the two classes. In a sense, yes. Right. So you have a group that is, and I wouldn't use that word, but unhappy, right? That they were yeah. mocked and that they had lost their influence. So they're more Jonah in that sense. As and opposed to Abraham. Other group that their hand is stayed. And of course, they're happy their hand is stayed. Right. right? So, yes. So it, re it does represent the, the two classes, the two different groups that are going to come out of that. You know, and I would have never recognized that before. Never. Nothing like that. Not okay. a way. But now that we're studying it like this, the way we are, I can see these things a lot, uh, uh, much easier. I mean, just I'm just saying, you know, that it, it's starting to get easier to understand these things. Yeah. So I mean, as so, a whole. Mm -hmm. And so when we look at, you know, Judges 16 um, and we see how. Delilah presses Samson, right, with these days. Then we can we can see with all the days, with the whole days, um, and with her words, she's pressing him. She's not uh, let up. Yeah, so this is something that comes upon us. And if his soul is vexed unto death, isn't this something that's related to our true conversion? Isn't it would have to be. Yeah, so the contemplation of all that God has given this movement is necessary for the third angel's message to accomplish its work in us in giving us a Christ-like character that can then be demonstrated to the world. So we've gone through this experience whether we look at it in a bit more of a macro level or a micro level. Um, but the purpose is for us to have Christ's character. Now, Delilah is going to sh in, demonstrate in the opposite of Christ's character to some degree, though he does also illustrate it in that he offers up his life, but under different circumstances than Christ, because he takes his own life. Christ has his life taken from him, though he yields it up willingly as well. But he's not committing suicide where we would say Samson is. Um, but anyway, as we go on, Dwight, you want to carry us further through this scripture? Okay. And when Delilah saw that he had told her all his heart, she sent and called for the lords of the Philistines, saying, Come up this once for he has showed me all his heart. Then the lords of the Philistines came up to her and brought money in their, in their hand. So in the Hebrew, what is being said, come up this once? Okay, so... Um... I mean, the way that the English is, is sounding, she's saying, come now. Okay, well, this word is, is, uh, is uh, to say it's once, I don't know if that even makes sense, um, because it can mean, uh, now, it can mean now, but it, it's used in lots of different senses of the word. 
um, there's lots of different ways in which it can be understood. Um, I mean, probably more it means now, I would think. But it, uh, the word itself means stroke, beat, foot, step, anvil, occurrence. So it's a foot or a hoof beat or a footfall or a footstep or an anvil. So it's like a t uh, an occurrence, a time, a stroke, a beat. So one time, once, twice, thrice, at this time, at this repetition, this once, now at length, now, now, at one time, at another. So, um, and, and it comes really from the word like to tap or to beat regularly. So it, it's kind of a strange word, come at one, up at once. So this is like a repetition, this once, but I mean, this is really just added. There's nothing of this at all in this verse. I'm not sure why they don't just, why they say this once. Um, Hebrew doesn't even have this and that in it. So um, in the sense that we do in English. So I don't know uh, why it has this word once here. What, what she's trying to say. It could mean just come up now. So that is possible. Okay, so again, if I was using ESORT on this, yeah, because the, the translators did not have anything that they, they gave reference with here, would we go back to Jeremiah 9, 4 to 6? Okay, and that's as it reads, take ye heed every one of his neighbor, and trust ye not in any brother, for every brother will utterly supplant, and every neighbor will walk with slanderers, and they will deceive every one his neighbor and will not speak the truth. They have taught their tongue to speak lies and weary themselves to commit iniquity. Thy habitation is in the midst of deceit. Through deceit, they refuse to know me, saith the Lord. Is this another ironic statement? Okay, I'm, I'm not following how that's connected to come up this once. But... Well, I'm just here again. I'm, I'm making use of the sources that I have at hand. Okay. Well, if we look at the first time this word once is used, okay. um, it's in Genesis 27, 36. And he said, is not he rightly named Jacob? For he has supplanted me these two times. So the word once there is translated two times. He took away my birthright and behold, now he hath taken away my blessing. And he said, hast thou not reserved a blessing for me? So this is going to be Esau, right? Okay. So, so Esau is saying this, but we have this word that's translated once as two times. So it's obviously, it's a weird way to translate it as at once. Um. But if we if we also looked at that in conjunction with Proverbs 18, 8. The words of a talebearer are as wounds, and they go down into the innermost parts of the belly. Jacob was seen as being a supplanter, a liar. Yeah. So. In the moral story. Delilah is the liar. Mm -hmm. In the moral story, Samson is not representing God in the manner that he should. Mm -hmm. In effect, lying as well. When we turn this up on its head, the message that's being given does not weary the neighbors. It makes it strengthens the neighbors and makes them feel 
that God cares. Now we're looking at Judges 16, 18, where Delilah now understands that Samson is willing to reveal what is really on his heart. And she sends and calls for the lords of the Philistines. Is not sending and calling another doubling. How? Well, here, here we're looking at this. She has sent for and she has called for. Why is that being said two different ways? Well, because they're not the same. Okay. How are they not the same? Um, well, so you're looking at... Um, Um, so this word shellac, um, so she sent away is really what it means. So she sent somebody away, uh, and kara, which means, um, uh, to bring somebody back is what it's, what it means called for. Lords of the Philistines. So she sent somebody away to bring somebody back. I mean, they're not the same thing. They're just part of a um, the one idea. You send somebody away to bring someone back. So is this similar to Abraham sending Eleazar to bring back a wife for Isaac? Yeah, that would be more like that. So in other words, what she is doing is she is sending someone to say, I'm willing to fulfill my covenant. Well, I don't know if there's necessarily a covenant implied here, but. Um... There's an agreement between Delilah and the Philistines. Is that not a covenant? Yeah, okay, I see what you're saying. But but the person being sent isn't fulfilling the covenant. I didn't say that. Yeah, that's what I thought you were saying. So the point is it's it's not a doubling. It's just it's just a, a normal action. Um sending a way to bring someone back. Um so and the other thing I wanted to look at is this once is also in Genesis 33, 3. Okay. Um, and he passed over before them and bowed himself to the ground seven times. There the word times is that same word that's translated once and also translated two times until he came near to his brother. So this is Jacob bowing seven times. Uh, um, Interesting scripture number. Yeah. Exactly, because 333, three, three, is that not a symbol of uh, three different ways or three times of the third angel's message? Yeah, plus also this word itself, the Hebrew word 6471, occurs in the King James 111 times. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay. Okay, she's advising the Philistines that she is now able to fulfill her promise. She is able to fulfill her covenant. Mm -hmm. Come up this once, for he has showed me all his heart. Then the lords of the Philistines came up unto her and brought money in their hand. So in bringing the silver in their hand, using the Hebrew word yod, 
Hebrew 3027. Yeah, hand. If you take the zero out of that, do we not have the numerical representation of 273? Yeah, well, you have March 27th. Yeah, but, yeah you have the 273. Okay, and the 273, like we would see in other parts of the scripture, has a different representation, I mean, on top of March 27th. Yeah, but it's, yeah, it symbolizes a message to the Levites. Exactly. And so this is in the hand of the Philistines. That is what's, what's in the hand of each of these kings is 1,100 pieces of silver. Right. And those 1,100 pieces of silver represent the 26th day of the fourth month, but also the 2,604 years of the prophetic mirror. Because the, the divisors in two different ways can, can be applied to those. Uh, the one was the fact that it can be divided uh, by five into 20, uh, 220. And the other is that it's, um, if we take all the divisors of that number, 1100, we get 2604. So, um, so in, at, either way we look at it, it's it's related to this message of um, the prophetic periods, the seven times and also July 18th itself. There's quite a lot in just this one verse. Mm -hmm. Now, is there something else we have not yet seen here? Well, one thing I just want to mention about, you know, we're using these Hebrew numbers. And, and, it, and it, it is rather interesting in a way. I mean, obviously, uh, these are somewhat arbitrary the way that you're uh, talking about strongs strongs i mean one is how he's yeah. dividing these hebrew words how he's deciding that something is a unique word uh in and of itself and giving a number to it you know it's arbitrary but in, in a lot of ways it, it's still based upon a kind of a reality that is he's he's alphabetizing the hebrew words in the bible and giving numbers to them alphabetically um but sim similar ways in which we divide the chapters. I mean, we can use the chapters as symbols. And a friend of mine was here on Sabbath. You know, he he didn't like me using the strong number symbols, uh, like for Delilah, for instance, because he, he doesn't like strongs. He's messianic and he hates strongs dictionary for good reason. There's lots of problems with strongs dictionary. But, but he has no problems with the verses, even though in a sense they have the same arbitrary nature. There's, there's a structure of the Bible, of course, but to take the verses as symbols man put them there and lots of times the verses should be divided differently um so so we're using these numbers but the question is why what is the basis we have to take strong's numbers and use them in this symbolic fashion has anybody thought about that specifically actually i have been thinking about it, but I really couldn't come up with anything other than um, the precedence has been set in some of the scriptural verses, which is something that was created by men. Okay. Right. Um, and then, and then you have this strong thing. This is something that's created with men, but almost everybody uses it um, with, with the Bible and the interpretations. And yeah, this stuff different. is all being led by God. And um, if we fail to miss little things like that, that um, are actually have some sort of meaning to us, um, wouldn't that be just like uh, disregarding what anything, any other little those things that come in to us, like the scripture verses themselves and not necessarily the, the numbers of them. I'm, I'm, I'm seeing the numbers of the scripture verses like Revelation 9, 11. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. I mean, that, so, that didn't mean crap to me until after 9-11. Yeah, just careful with your language. So, I'm sorry. So we, we have, here we have 
scripture verses that we can recognize. And we could recognize even calendar dates, 70 AD, you know, 70 AD for the destruction of Jerusalem. Uh, it wasn't chosen for the destruction of Jerusalem when they created the BC AD. That's not why they put 70 AD as the destruction of Jerusalem. Right. Right. They just had miscalculated the history at the time when they first gave us this AD uh, BC syst system. Right. Uh, they gave it to us uh, to try to figure out when Christ was born. They believed he was born in 1 AD. Of course, he wasn't. So, um, but but anyway, the point is we, we can use those. But now we hear we have something that is a main function of studying the Bible, of going through God's word. Without Strong's numbers, it's much more difficult. I mean, you, Cruden's doesn't use Strong's numbers. Um, but strong numbers, Strong's numbers are very, very useful to see, uh, and especially when you use the, uh, like his numbers for the concordance itself. Or the uh, meanings of names and other yeah. things that we all hold. Yeah. Now, Strong's has lots of problems as a dictionary itself because he wasn't really a Hebrew scholar. Right. But, but still, we can see that these symbolic numbers apply to something we already have seen. That is, you can't have a symbol contradict a scripture. The plain reading of scripture should be understood. But we also have here in the story of Samson something quite odd, that is this ironic story that pretty much everybody recognizes as a parallel with Christ. And so in this story itself, any type of symbol becomes extremely important to interpret it. So, you know, the seven I would laws. Agree. Right? And so if we can even look at the word itself, you know, that word once, and we can see that it's attached to Jacob and Esau in two different ways, being deceived two times, right? Right? Notice that, the two times he's deceived? Exactly. And then right. also... Uh, Jacob bows seven times, right? So we have this two times and this seven times. And we also recognize this twofold test, right? This doubling. And, and we see this here in this story because there are these, um, in, in the story of Samson, these two different tests that are being put before this movement, this choice. We also have the seven locks of his head. So, so we can see, we can tie all these stories together with these words. And the, the fact that we can take the Hebrew numbers of some of these words, and we can see in them symbols that tie to this movement, isn't like a main argument, right? But it is something that witnesses to something we've already seen. I like to call it the blessed reassurance. Okay, that's fine. Yes, but but you understand the point. The point is we're absolutely make a main argument. No, it's not the proof. This is this isn't the proof. Yeah, this is just something that that gives us a clue that we are on the right uh, yeah. track. And it does help us in our interpretation. So if you take judges, um, that was the one where it was the money in their hand, right? Um, 16, 18 in front of you. Yeah, and then you're going to have 16, 23, where it talks about um, our God hath delivered Samson, our enemy, into our hand. Right? So you're we'll, get to, to, we'll, we'll hopefully get to that tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah, so, so you're going to start to see that this word being used in one place and being used in another and having this symbol attached to it by the Hebrew number helps us to understand uh, it, it, it's not our main argument for interpretation, but it shows we're on the right track. And then we can relate these two together. Definitely, if I was out hiking and I seen this marker, I would want to start following that direction. Okay. Yeah, especially if you're in a snowstorm and you see a little peg 
sticking out of the ground as you're going over a ridge. Right. <laughs> and then you see another one. Well, you're gonna you're gonna follow the line of where those pegs are. That's and right. You're gonna hope you see another one. When you see That's another right. one, and you keep yeah, seeing. But you have to keep looking pegs. around a little. You don't. It, it just doesn't come up on all of a sudden. You know, you have to look around for it. Yeah, and and I've done that personally. And then mm -hmm. the, the peg zigzag as you go up this ridge because it's a switchback. Switchbacks. You, you got to really watch because you can't see much ahead of you at all. That, mm. that happened to me. So, so I always think of that illustration. Okay. So Dwight? Well, we are coming to the close of our time together today. Now, do we have any other comments or questions that we have not delved into at this moment? I got a comment. Please. Same comment I gave you last night before you signs off. <laughs> Check your email. Uh, okay. I will. You saying we don't have your email? No, I'm I just said that uh, I haven't seen the the um, requests that I had put in yesterday for his for the notes. Cuz I sent them to you as well. No, no, that's the notes on um uh on the what Sabbath I want, presentation. That was the notes on the Sabbath. What I was actually looking for was there it is now, Judges 16. Okay. That's thank you. I appreciate cool. it, sir. Okay. Yeah, you've taken all the time to do all this wonderful work. Um, and I just want to throw my throw other stuff in there, the stuff that we we're studying now, you know. I like to put notes inside of this stuff. Sure. And since you've already got it already detailed, I don't have to go looking around for all those things. I appreciate that, sir. Well, brother, you're more than welcome. I mean, what little I've done here, I mean, is just this is this is where I was led to work. And glory <laughs> this on is this. actually a lot, you know, when you're looking at this on a, as a a a chapter. Mm -hmm because that's what we're looking at, a, a chapter. And then you've now combined all those little things, um, the, uh, the strong stuff and, and those things. So I don't have to go searching for those and then do the copy paste. Thank you, you have done a lot of work and then I'll just throw some other stuff in there and I'll send it back to you so you can okay. kind of look at it. All right, okay, so anything else? Any other requests, any other comments? Any other concerns of what we've been addressing today? You, you can send me all the other chapters that we've done from all this right. point, uh, on, especially on judges. I'm, I'm going back over some of this to see if there's other things that Mrs. White has written, because as, as I had set these up initially, uh, I have the, the primary file, like Judges 16, just as Judges 16. When I've gone in and been led to look up the portions of the Spirit of Prophecy, I have those listed as Judges 16a. Right. Because it's, it's got the additions in there. Right. I get it. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. So um, I'm just going to tell you, like I told Theodore, that anything that I get from you guys, mm -hmm. um, I put it in a file uh, determined by date. Okay. okay. So if, if there's anything that I receive after that particular stuff, um, it might be titled the same stuff, but it goes underneath a different date. Sure. Um, that way I have a, like a chronological order of how we discover things and then how we might modify those things. And you, you hear what I'm saying on that? I, I get what you're saying. I've got, I've got uh, Theodore's uh, PowerPoints and I've got two different series of his. And so I don't change them or anything, but I might drag from them, you know, to, to, to build one of my own, but I, I still utilize the, the time element on, on those documents yeah. as well. 
Okay, well, let's close with prayer. Okay. Loving Father, we thank you for this time that we've been able to spend opening your word and examining more of your character and that which you would have us to understand. Be with us each today. Guide us where you would have us to walk so that your will may be done in our lives and your character may be shown to those with whom we come in contact. Bless us to this end today. Direct us so that we may come closer to you. For this we ask and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.